Hi everybody, uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, give you a presentation. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, a project that we completed recently um, in partnership with Safe Work New South Wales. Um, and the title on the slide, Understanding and Preventing Work-Related Violence in Hospital Settings, a Systems Thinking Approach. Essentially, we were applying um, a set of systems thinking methods to try and really complete a comprehensive analysis of the factors which contribute to work-related violence in hospital settings. So I'll take you through um, the project and what we did and what the key findings were, and, and hopefully you find it useful. Um, so the background, and I think probably most of you in the audience uh, have a good understanding of this. So work-related violence in hospital settings is obviously um, a significant and growing issue, both in Australia and worldwide. Um, and obviously, it has significant personal, personal and social costs uh, and adverse impacts on the quality of care. And there's obviously various studies that have shown that. Um, the interesting thing with work-related violence in hospital settings uh, specifically is there's, there's really been extensive research into this over the world uh, and there's been a range of interventions that have been attempted and there's been varying levels of success of these different interventions so for example things like staff education on de-escalation techniques um, aggression management teams uh, sharing of knowledge uh, between uh, groups and departments of high-risk patients there's, there's some good evidence to show they have uh, a positive effect in in reducing work-related violence but interestingly, some of the more, I guess, widely recommended interventions, um, there's really very little evidence to show that they work. So things like duress alarms, um, incident reporting and learning systems, zero to tolerance policies, there's actually no evidence to show that they um, have an impact uh, in terms of reducing work-related violence. And certainly we think uh, one limiting factor is that these interventions are being adopted um, even though they've been developed for other contexts. So, you, for example, you might have a recommendation for duress alarms in a particular setting overseas that's then implemented, say, in Australia. And, and we think a, a part of the problem there is that the interventions aren't being developed on a, a detailed and in-depth understanding of the problem in our own context. Uh, and so I guess that's one of the drivers for this research programme. Um, and so really, I, I mentioned systems thinking at the start. That, there was a, a, a strong systems theoretical underpinning to this research and the whole point indeed of the project was to apply systems thinking. Uh, and, and I always put this quote up from Atino who kind of says, you know, if you want to understand the behaviour uh, of a complex system, um, you have to look at the overall system itself. And, and then within that, you need to look at the interactions between the parts of the system. And so with work related violence in hospital settings, that tells us very clearly that we can't understand the problem just by looking at healthcare workers, uh, patients and security guards, for example, and the people directly involved in the incident. There's much more going on than that. So really, we have to look at the broader um, hospital system. Um, we use a particular theory, which is Rasmussen's Risk Management Framework, which is on the right hand side of the slide there. Very simple theory it tells us that any complex system has a hierarchy with multiple uh, actors and organisations at different levels of the hierarchy. So you can see on the slide there, government to regulators, to company, to management, to staff and work. Um, and what the theory kind of says is, you know, any adverse event, in this case, work-related violence, is really created by the decisions and actions of everybody in that hierarchy across all of the levels. You can't just isolate it down to the so-called sharp end and focus on the workers. Um, any kind of work-related violence incident, whether it be minor or, you know, really severe, uh, will have multiple contributing factors. So it's not just the result of a single poor decision or action. Um, a key factor that drives adverse events such as work late violence is poor communication and feedback across levels of the system and not just from deficiencies at one level alone. And, and within that, a key concept is vertical integration, which talks about the importance of having uh, information regarding the decisions and actions made at the high levels of the system flow down that hierarchy and then information on how the system is behaving at the lower levels to feed back up the hierarchy and inform decisions and actions. And the theory kind of suggests that without that, you lose control. Um, migration happens, so behaviours degrade over time and under different pressures. Um, and really, they are they kind of lead the system uh, towards failure, and then a triggering event will cause uh, a work-related violence incident. The theory also talks about other kind of important things here. So, you know, errors, we talk about human errors of, often and 
you know, violations might be labelled in work-related violence incidents. Really, this, they're, they're a, a consequence of broader system issues. So we, we say that errors aren't a cause of anything. They're a consequence of factors across the system. Um, if we want to understand failure, we really need to look at why people's actions made sense to them at the time. So if there is a work-related violence incident, um, why did that act, action, uh, if you like, from, from a perpetrator, why did that make sense to them at the time? Why did they feel that that was something they had to do? And often that gives you a very different perspective on, on incident causation. So that's the theory that we, we used in the project. Um, and the project aims itself were really to identify the factors across the hospital system which contribute to work-related violence and then identify a series of you know, ideas for system-wide interventions that can be used to better prevent and manage work-related violence. Uh, the scope of the project, just to put some boundaries around that, so the focus of the research was on healthcare sector specifically um, and specifically hospital settings in New South Wales only. Um, by workplace violence, we, we use the definition on the slide there, and I'll, I'll let you read that. Um, but obviously, just to point out that the, there's a range there around you know, any form of assault, any form of indecent physical contact, and indeed intimidating behaviour that creates a fear of violence, such as stalking or threatening to do any of the above. Um, the phases itself, we basically applied three methods that, allow, that accompany that systems theory. Um, so we developed what's called an ACTA map um, for hospital settings in New South Wales, and I'll, I'll go into more detail in these in a second. We then developed an AXI map, and then we developed recommendations for interventions using a method that we call Preventi Maps. So phase one, uh, the ACTA map. Um, so basically, the ACTA map takes that system hierarchy that I talked about, uh, and you're basically identifying which actors and organisations sit at the different levels. So if we think of the staff level there, very simply, you can you know, say that um, healthcare workers, kind of nurses, for example, would sit at that staff level. So ActiMap is about really developing the map of the stakeholders who share responsibility for safety in a particular system. Um, so we developed one of these for hospital settings in New South Wales. Um, initially, we developed a draft based on documentation review and website review. Um, we then conducted a workshop with subject matter experts to, to refine the model. Uh, in the workshop, participants were given an overview of the project, the aims and its scope, and we took them through the model basically, and they were asked to comment on whether it was valid and whether to add, they could add to it or take things out of it. And we then sent the refined model round uh, for review afterwards. Um, in terms of who was at that workshop, so you can see we had 18 participants, uh, average age of 50. Um, we had a nice range of roles across the hospital system, if you like, so chief executive officers, WHS managers, coordinators, program managers, and clinical consultant, and a nice, you know, good experience of uh, working in roles where they shared the responsibility for managing or preventing work-related violence in the healthcare sector. Um, here's the ACTA app, and, and you know, obviously quite complex, and that's not surprising at all. And so the first thing you can see is that we've modified those levels on the left hand side of the hierarchy. So you can see start at the bottom, we've got the hospital environment and related equipment. So basically anything in that hospital environment where the incident itself happens. Uh, we've then got actors directly involved in violence with hospital settings. Uh, the next level up is healthcare delivery specialists, coordination, coordinators and WHS specialists. Lifting up a level, we've got your kind of managerial level, which comprises healthcare management centres of expertise, incident response management and media. Lifting it up a level, we have external regulation, standardisation, coordination, industry representation and worker representation. And then we have a government and international levels up above that. Um, and I, obviously, I won't talk you through this. You can kind of read you, your own detail uh, in the report. Um, but you can see it's really quite complex. And the grey shading there are, are basically um, actors in the system who have a formal decision-making authority to actually prevent or respond to work-related violence incident. So an example at the kind of lower level, sharp end of the system there, police officers can actually step in and make an arrest and security staff are kind of mandated to step in and prevent uh, an incident. But so as the outcome map shows, there's, there's various stakeholders that share responsibility. The key thing that tells us in a project of this kind is that, you know, contributory factors will come from all of these different actors so it's you know there's you can see already there's going to be 
uh, a number of contributing factors and indeed moving forward in terms of developing interventions to better prevent work-related violence in hospitals you would start to look at involving a, a good proportion of these actors in developing interventions as they share responsibility for the issue. Um, the second phase was to start to look at the contributing factors so what what is actually contributing to work-related violence in hospital systems in New South Wales, and that was through developing an AXI map, or you know, known as the accident mapping technique. Um, and this again is part of Rasmussen's risk management framework. What the AXI map does is you take that hierarchy again, and you're starting to look at contributing factors and where they sit in that hierarchy. So, for example, if it's something that a security guard or a nurse at the sharp end does, it would sit at that second level. If it's something to do with the equipment, it would sit at the bottom level. If it's something to do with regulation, it would sit at the regulatory body level. So you're trying to tease out the network of contributing factors across the entire uh, hospital system here. Um, here's an example of one that we've done previously, just to give you an idea of what they look like. So this is was looking at um, barriers to eating disorder treatment access. And so you can see there are many barriers around individuals and sharp end processes there, but also there are some that kind of sit at the service delivery and social environment level, the local area government level, and the regulatory body and associations level. Um, how do we develop this one? So this was a bit of a, a more uh, comprehensive process. So here we did um, a review of systematic literature reviews, something that's called an umbrella review. So this covered 340 journals looking at contributing factors to work-related violence incidents. We extracted um, the contributing factors from those reviews and basically coded them ourselves onto that uh, hierarchy that you saw. We then held an internal USC researcher workshop where we kind of went through and refined the themes and put them at the right level and so on. Uh, the Safe Work Project team then had a review of it um, and then we refined the axiom app and then we held another workshop which followed the same format um, as the last workshop where we basically took participants through the model and they were asked to agree or disagree on the factors and suggest new ones uh, and change the terminology and so on and so forth. We actually held two workshops to refine the Aximap because we had such a good um, stakeholder group that we split them across two workshops so we could kind of really get as much as possible from them um, and obviously refine the model and send it out for comment afterwards. Um, there's just an overview of the participants. So you can see we had 16 participants Similarly, average age around 50, and again, a nice spread of different actors from across that hierarchy of the hospital setting system in, in New South Wales. Um, this is a very complex version of the Axi map. I just wanted to show you this to say that it's big and there's lots of contributing factors. Um, the shading also um, is quite interesting on here. Uh, what that's basically telling us is so the, the boxes on there that are white. So they were contributing factors that we found in the literature reviews and that the participants or in our workshops agreed with. And the grey ones, the grey boxes are contributing factors that were added by the stakeholder group. So you can see there immediately there's a good contribution of knowledge beyond the literature from the stakeholder group. Um, the grey was workshop two, sorry. The blue was workshop three. So again, workshop three added more. And then the two little orange ones are factors that there was a there was some disagreement in the group about whether they actually were contributing factors. So you can see political attitudes and governance of private versus public sectors. So there was some participants in the workshops who felt they weren't actually contributing factors. So we made a note of them also. What we did with this model is we reduced it down to make it a bit more easier to read, and, and we basically created a summary axi map. Uh, what I will say is in the report, there's all of the specific detail around these contributing factors. So there's kind of a, what we call a data dictionary, which describes each uh, factor. Um, but the summarized version looks like this. And so you can see um, there's a, and each node in this model is basically a category of contributing factors, and there's multiple contributing factors underneath that. So if we look at the second level from bottom there, look at patient factors, for example, uh, we can flick back here. Uh, we can we can kind of go back and look at the other um, axiom up on the slide before. I can't actually do that because I'm recording. But essentially, there's probably 10, 15 factors to do with patients within that box. So this is very much a summary diagram. But you can see, you know, in you know, straight away, we can see that there are contributing factors, multiple contributing factors spanning all levels of the hospital system. And that's really interesting to us because that tells us that you know, it's a systems problem, obviously. So it's not just something that's created by 
healthcare workers, patients and security guards and, and the environment. It's created by the decisions and actions of everybody across that hospital system. The kind of um, the amount of contributory factors we identified also tells us something else very interesting, and that is there's really no one uniform contributory network of factors for these incidents. So what that means is basically, you know, if you take 10 work-related violence incidents, they might all each have a very different causal pattern underneath them in terms of the contributory factors. So you can kind of see, uh, you know, there might be one set of factors for one incident across all levels of this system. Another incident might have an entirely different set of contributory factors. And that is really important for what you then do about the problem. It tells us there's no uh, silver bullet, if you like, and actually what we need are um, sets of interventions that try and tackle different contributory factor patterns, if you like. Some of the interesting ones I will pick out on here. So we kind of know about the patient factors and the healthcare worker factors, security factors, the hospital environment things, um, hospital related equipment. We kind of know all of that from the literature and that's well described in the report. Some of the really interesting ones here, um, you can see there's some that span a few levels of the system. So culture, for example, was the culture around work related violence and, uh, and, and safety and patient safety and worker safety was found to be an issue across, you see, what, five levels of the hospital system there. Also collaboration, coordination and consultation. Um, was found to be a factor across those five levels. And, and so that's telling us that, you know, there are silos in how in different areas of people trying to respond to this issue and they're not particularly working well together uh, in response to these issues. And then, you know, if we look at the high levels of the system, there's some of the ones we would expect to see here. So things around planning, uh, compliance with standards, guidelines and legislation, policies, procedures, uh, enforcement and prosecution, qualifications, frameworks, budgetary constraints, recruitment and retention, um, organisational goals and, and integration, and so on and so forth. A final comment on this slide is that you can see right at the top there, we found a set of factors that the participants and the literature you know, suggested sit outside of the hospital system. So these are more societal issues rather than anything to do with the hospital system per se, but they felt they also played a role um, in work-related violence in hospitals. And these are things like societal issues, perceptions and attitudes of healthcare, and what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable in a, in a hospital environment, um, availability of accommodation and social housing, the workload of police and availability, rising healthcare costs, um, land use planning and urban design, and, and things like web-based healthcare information. So that's another interesting set that I would encourage people to read about in the report if you do take a look. Um, I'll move on in the interest of time. Um, what we then did in the project was we said, OK, so we, now we know who shares the responsibility for the problem, all of the stakeholders. Uh, we now know all of the factors that contribute to the problem. We obviously can't recommend inter interventions for all of those, however many contributing factors. So let's look, at lev look for leverage points. And leverage points are an interesting part of systems theory, which really uh, represent places in a complex system where small changes can have large and significant effects. So what we're effectively doing is saying, you know, now that we know all this interesting stuff about the hospital system, do we think there are places within hospital systems where we can make just small interventions that will really have a dramatic effect on many of these contributing factors and will really bring down the problem of work-related violence? Uh, and I would encourage people to look at Meadows' work, which is all, all over the internet, very interesting. Um, the point in, in you know, safety science is that often we don't use these leverage points. Um, they're not really particularly intuitive. And even if we know about them, we're often using them in the wrong way. And we're actually driving up a problem rather than reducing the problem. So it's really interesting concept. Um, we sat down as a research group and we worked out where those leverage points were. Um, what we thought from based on what we found is that there's, there are nine of them, or nine key kind of areas, if you like, and we basically themed these up from the models. So that's the design of the hospital environment, um, risk management processes, methods, um, outputs, feedback, sufficient and capable staffing. So, you know, the staffing, things like recruitment and retention, the training and education, um, promoting the safety and dignity of patients and healthcare workers. Um, managing the risk of patients with a high propensity for violence. So, you know, you have this kind of cohort of, of patients who do have a high propensity and, and there should be ways of managing them a little bit differently. 
Um, collaboration, consultation and coordination obviously is one that we saw on the Axi map, which spans multiple levels. Um, public attitudes and behaviours towards healthcare workers. Um, timely and effective incident response, and then incident reporting and learning systems generally. And I think it's important to note that that's not just the incident report and learning system itself. That's, again, how you use it, how you train people to use it, what you do with incident reports, um, how you feed back the information, whether the information gets to the right stakeholders in the system, and so on and so forth. So, so we, we felt from the analysis there were these kind of leverage points that we think thought interventions should tie. And so for the final phase, and I'm in the interest of time, I better hurry up. I think I'm a couple of minutes over already. Um, we use a method called Preventi Maps. And Preventi Maps, again, is aligned with Rasmussen's risk management theory. It's basically take, building a version of an AXI map, which instead of including contributing factors, includes interventions. So, you know, if you have an AXI map with contributing factors across levels of the system, you develop a Preventi map to show where interventions would be required across levels of the system to wipe out the contributing factors and it's really the idea is to target leverage points and also to promote fundamental systems change rather than a component fix so we're not just going to try and say um, we'll just give uh, duress alarms here it's more fundamentally changing the system um, here's just an example and so you can see you know at the sharp end there if you want enhanced performance the fact the nodes across the other levels there show what changes you need to make across the system to, to achieve that enhanced performance. Um, we conducted a, another set of workshops. These were a little bit different. So we had stakeholders and because we had nine leverage points on nine target areas, we had to split the participants into three groups. Each group moved to a breakout room with a facilitator and were asked to basically build a preventive map for one of the nine key theme areas. Um, we then came back as a group and we presented the interventions back to the group and the group could then contribute. And basically we repeated that process three times. Um, afterwards, we built the preventive maps and we sent them out for review to the, all, the, the, the whole stakeholder group. Um, again, you know, good set of participants there. We had 14 for this part and again, similar kind of spread of experience and roles. Um, obviously, you can't see this. I'm just flagging that we developed nine preventive maps. And, and again, would encourage people to take a look at the, the report where you can see the specific details. But essentially, what you have on the slide there uh, is a preventive map for each of those nine key areas. What we also did with this is we said, well, there are, there are commonalities across these preventive maps. So there, there were interventions that would appear um, in multiple preventive maps. So we said, well, let's take the interventions that appear in uh, three or more. And let's make a, an aggregate preventive map. And the idea with this was to say, look, we have the nine preventive maps, which is a, a roadmap moving forward, but let's look at what need, what's needed initially. And that really is what the intention was here. So this preventive map is kind of what we think are actions and interventions that are required you know, straight away, essentially. Um, and you can see there's some interesting ones at the government level is kind of review, upgrade, development of policy, and that's around instant reporting and analyzing WHS data, staffing models, clarifying roles and responsibilities for the different actors involved in work-related violence, um, for work-related violence, risk identification and management. Obviously, increased funding is required for different kind of interventions, such as risk management, uh, specialist services, adequate number of mental health beds and healthcare workers, and so on. Um, improved safety culture and leadership was a big one across multiple levels. And then the one on the right hand side of the slide we felt was really important it really is the kind of first step uh, and that was development of an independent multi-agency collaboration group uh, with the aim of really trying to get at that problem of communication collaboration and consultants consultation between actors across the different levels of the system uh, investigating best practices recommending improvements to national standards advocating for the use of evidence-based practice and also development procurement criteria we also had education for healthcare workers around understanding mental illnesses and health conditions and how they influence behaviour, risk assessment, responding to and managing work-related violence, um, and identifying and managing own biases. Also for inspectors to receive training related to healthcare investigations. Moving down the system a bit, we had standardised, increased standardised and cross-disciplinary training, de-escalation and restraint training, training in mental health and mentoring by senior mental health staff. Uh, these are all kind of designed to improve 
WHS specialist skills and knowledge, um, increased scenario-based training and practice drills, and then kind of at the environment and equipment level, there was also artifacts to provide guidance on appropriate incident reporting and also acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So we, these were kind of interventions that seemed to appear repeatedly across the different leverage point areas. Um, so just to kind of bring that together and summarize, so obviously what the project showed very clearly is work-related violence is influenced by a large and diverse set of actors across all levels of the hospital system. Um, you know, it, it is a complex system. Uh, there are many actors who share the responsibility for the behavior and safety of that system. Uh, and so do share the responsibility for work-related violence and indeed should be working together um, to resolve the issue. Um, the Axiom app showed very clearly that work-related violence is created by multiple contributing factors. There are many different ways that issues across the hospital system will interact to create a work-related violence incident, or in other ways saying that there are multiple causal pathways. That's really important because it tells us there's no real silver bullet fix. There's, there's work across all levels of the system, there's work in different areas and so on. Um, and, and we feel you know, very strongly that the research was telling us that improved management and prevention can only be achieved through system reform. So you, you know, you're, fun, you're making fundamental changes to the hospital system rather than trying to make a, a, a component fix at, at a lower level. Uh, recommendations, so take a look at the report. The aggregate preventing map outlines a set of interventions that are required to facilitate this system reform. We certainly think the establishment of the independent multi agency collaboration group is an important first step, uh, and that this group could really then drive some of the development of interventions suggested in the other preventing maps. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present this work, and I will say thank you to um, Safe Work New South Wales for actually sponsoring the project and you know, having the, the initiative and innovation to apply this thinking in this area. I think it's a really great um, approach and a really great project. Um, I would encourage people to read the report. There's a lot of detail underneath those models that I've presented, and obviously I can't do justice to that in 25 minutes, although it's now 27. Uh, so the link's on the slide there, so please do uh, take a look. Uh, thank you very much.